Alors je donne tout de suite la parole à M. Heissam Sitki, qui nous vient de l'Université de Chicago et qui va donner une conférence donc, en anglais sur les euh, recensions régionales. Ok, uh, I'm speaking in English. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers and uh, thank you all for being here uh, this late. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it maybe a little bit entertaining uh, so you can follow along. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, on the regionality of, of uh, Quranic codices. So to start off with, I want to summarize the traditional account of the uh, Uthmanic project, the Masahef project. Uh, one of the aspects of this project is that uh, reports indicate that Uthman sent out different codices, different exemplars, to different cities. Now, I'm going to spare you the details, but what I want to do is present a summary uh, of the reports regarding these uh, accounts. And Adani, Abu Amr Adani, he's an Andalusian uh, uh, Muslim scholar, and he has a book called Al Muqna, and he summarizes these, these uh, uh, reports for us. And so he says that uh, most scholars are of the opinion that when Uthman wrote the Mus'haf, he made it into four copies. He then sent to each territory, directing one to Kufa, another to Basra, the third to Syria, and reserved one for where he was. And that is often understood as Medina. So in this first report, we have the idea of there being four exemplars, four main copies of the Quran that were made that were sent out to the different regions. Now he also says that it was said that he made it into seven copies, so three additional copies, and that those copies were sent to Mecca Yemen and Bahrain. But Adani says that the first report is more connect, uh, correct, and this is what most scholars uh, agree upon, is the first report that there were six of those. Now, in al muqna and in other books that have to do with Rasm literature, so the orthography of the Quran, we have different reports of the variants associated with these four different regional uh, uh, mushafs, in addition to Mecca, so the fifth one. But we don't have any data on Yemen and Bahrain or any other Mus'haf, so I just want you to keep that in mind. Now, what do these regional variants look like? So this is just a very simplified example, and I, I can classify them into two different types. So here, for example, in uh, uh, Surah 10.22, we have what's called an isolated variant. So this report says that this variant of Yanshurukum is present only in Syrian Mus'hafs, and in all other Mus'hafs, it is Yusayyirukum. So this is an isolated variant. On the other hand, we have shared variants. So in Surah Al-Baqarah, Q2, 132, we have the Iraqi Mus'hafs, uh, so Kufa and Basra, saying, Wawassa, and then the Medinan and Syrian Mus'hafs having an additional Alif, saying, Wa'awsa. So we can categorize, classify the variants into two types, isolated variants and shared variants. Now with that in mind, uh, Michael Cook in 2004 published a very clever paper. And what he did is he went to the back of Al-Muqna and he collected about 40 of these reports. He wasn't exhaustive, but he just picked 40 of them. And he said, let me look and see if I can construct a stemma. And a stemma is basically a relationship between the manuscripts. So it describes you know, how one was copied from the other. Now, just so you can follow along, I've abbreviated Syria into S, Medina into M, Basra B and Kufa K. Now the first thing he noticed is there are 16 variants that are exclusive to Syria. So I just put here a marker for Syria. And then he notes that there are six variants that are exclusive to Kufa, and so I put Kufa right there. And then he notes that there are 13 variants that are shared by Medina and Syria and Basra and Kufa. So Medina and Syria share 16, and Basra and Kufa have something different in those same 16 spots. And so what that does is it means that because Syria has isolated variants, it is less related to Basra, and because Kufa has isolated variants, it's less related to Medina. And so by arranging them in this way, we can connect them, and this represents a relationship between these four hypothetical codices. Okay? Now, there is a wrinkle in this, so something gets a little complicated, in that there's one variant that's exclusive to Basra. So what does that mean? If we think about it, that means that there would have to be a mushaf, a codex, from which Medina was copied, from which Basra and Kufa was copied as well. Otherwise, what we're saying is that, for example, Medina was copied to Basra, and then 
it had an isolated variant, but then when it was copied to Kufa, it was changed back to what was in Medina. And that's what we call, it doesn't make sense, it's contamination. So for now, he sets this aside, and we'll get back to it later. So we'll set this one aside, and just, uh, uh, we'll take a leap of faith, and we'll go forward. And so if we consider no other codices outside of these four, we can say, let's pick the Syria as being the exemplar, and so we have this relationship. So Syria was copied, Medina was copied from Syria, Basra was copied from Medina, and Kufa was copied from Basra. We can put, otherwise pick Medina as the, as the uh, archetype, and then we get this relationship, and you do the same with Basra and Kufa. Now, what Michael Cook says is that this data is enough to give us this relationship, but it's not enough to identify which of these four is the actual uh, stemma that represents these manuscripts. And so Michael Cook concludes, he says that given this data and the fact that there's basically no contamination here, that the single most striking feature of the variants reported is the lack of any serious indication of contamination. Therefore, this must count against any suggestion that the variants were invented. So if you think about you know, mo later Muslim scholars sitting down and making up variants, fabricating them, then it's very odd that they would fabricate something that would give us a stemma, a very clean stemma like this. So there must be some truth to it. And this is what he says. He says, well, Muslim scholars were not aware of stematology or stematics. This is a relatively new science. So it would be very strange for them to fabricate this. And so Michael Cook concludes, he says that what we can do is we can infer that we really have genuine transmission from an archetype. Okay? Now he also looks at the Meccan variants and he finds that they're very contaminated. And so he sets that aside and says, for now it seems that these four are the ones that are more genuine. Okay? And so I ask the question, you know, what can we learn about regionality from actual manuscripts, looking at the material evidence? So Michael Cook did a great study on the actual variants we have in our books, but what happens when we actually start looking at early manuscripts? And so for this work, I've surveyed over 60 manuscripts. And a lot of them are very fragmentary, so they might have one or two regional variants, and some of them are more complete. And so I just wanted to highlight, I'm not going to go through this list, the major ones that I look, uh, look at include some very old uh, mushafs or uh, codices, such as the Codex Persina Petropolitanus, uh, the British Library Mushaf and its associated Arab folios, the BNF, uh, Vechtai 1913, and uh, a bunch of, and the Sana'a Palimpsest, uh, the upper text, uh, and the associated folios from Hamdun's thesis. And so I look at a bunch, all of these mushafs, and these are the major ones that uh, play a role in my analysis. So the first thing I do is using all 60 of these manuscripts, I look at, well, if we go through and identify these variants, and I've, I actually added on to the variants that uh, Michael Cook looks at, how good do they agree uh, with the actual distribution that are reported in the, in the literature? And so this summarizes all of the data. And the way you read this is this, is you, you look at a signed region, so this is, I, I go through a, a mushaf and I say, what does this best agree with? And let's say it comes out to be Syria, and I say, well, okay, it best agrees with Syria, but how good does it agree? And so you see, on average, Syrian mushafs agree about 83%, and on average, 8% Medinan flavor or Medinan variants, 5% Basran, 3% Kufan, and 1% Meccan. So if we look along this diagonal, this is sort of the, the main bulk of it, we can see Medinan on average, we have 88% agreement, Basran, 98% agreement, Kufan, 91, and I found no manuscripts that were identified originally as, as Meccan, that were majority Meccan. But some Mus'hafs contain Meccan variants, and so you see Mecca here for uh, Syria and Medina. Now, what I highlight right here are just a few of the Mus'hafs that I showed earlier of these manuscripts, uh, and the, the, the details of the breakdown of those manuscripts. So if you look at the CPP, uh, we find that it's 93% in agreement with Syria, and 7% Kufa, uh, BL, uh, 2165, 87% uh, Syria, uh, uh, DAM 27, this is the uh, palimpsest uh, and the associated folios, it's 100% Medinan. Uh, uh, as well as the DAM 29, this is also 100% Medinan. Uh, and then you get a, a bunch of different Basran manuscripts, some are, are quite later, uh, but you find a lot of 100% agreement here. Uh, and then we have Arab 331, which is 67% agreement. Uh, so what I want to do next is zoom in a little bit and see what's the source of this disagreement. Uh, and, and, and talk about that a little bit. Uh, so, uh, the interesting ones, uh, to me a little bit, are the CPP, the uh, Codex Parasino Petropolitanos, and BLOR 2165. 
So for the CPP, we have 28 attested variants. So in the surviving folios, or the folios we have access to in the edition produced by uh, Professor uh, Desroches, uh, there are 28 variants and only two deviations. Uh, and those two deviations are, have to do with qala and qul. Okay, so where one would expect qala, it's spelled as qul. Uh, and if you look at the British Library Mus'haf, we find the same thing. Uh, there are 26 variants present, uh, three deviations, and it's the same thing where you would expect qala, uh, you find qul. And you can imagine that when you have this defectiveness in, the, in, the, in qala and early manuscripts, uh, it can still be read as qala, so it's a bit ambiguous. But actually, if you go to the literature, what you'll find is the variants that Michael Cook classified as being absolutely assigned to those regions. Uh, in earlier works such as Abu Ubaid's Fadail, and even in works from uh, uh, Al-Andarabi and others, they do not attribute these variants, these Qala Qul variants, to all other Mus'hafs other than Kufa. So Abu Ubaid here, for example, attributes it only to a difference between the Mus Mus'hafs of Kufa and Basra, and says nothing about the other Mus'hafs. And Andarabi says it's actually present only in some Mus'hafs and others not. And the Dani says that same thing in earlier in his book, uh, but not later in his book. So, so these variants are not necessarily very strong. And so, so if we set these aside, we find that our oldest manuscripts, like CPP and uh, the British Library Mus'haf, are in 100% agreement with what we have reported uh, about the Syrian variants. Another thing I wanted to point out, which was interesting, is by Sakh uh, Sakhawi. So he was a 9th century uh, Hijri uh, Muslim scholar. And he actually talks about a mushaf that he observed. So he talks about uh, a mushaf that he saw in, uh, uh, that has, that's, it's a mushaf of the people of Sham, the people of Syria. It's ancient, Atiq. Uh, and he said that, I think that it might be one of the exemplars or a copy of it. So to him, it was very old. And what does he say about it? He says, well, first of all, this mushaf is found in Damascus. Uh, in a masjid in an area known as Kishk, I'm not sure where this is, but if anyone knows, I'd, be, I'd love to, to hear. Uh, but he says that, I have inspected this mushaf and I followed the rasminat, the orthography, and I found that it is 100% in agreement with the variants. And it's very interesting that he, Sakhawi, does not consider these variants, the Qala Qul variants, to be part of the Syrian uh, variants. So to him as well, inspecting a very old mushaf, he finds the same thing. Now, looking at discrepancies as well between the described variants in literature and in what we find in manuscripts, we can actually date the traditions. So did these Muslim scholars like Abu Ubaid and Farah, did they have access to information from the people who copied these mushafs? Uh, or do they get their information a little bit later? So I want to talk about two examples. The first one is a Syrian variant. And the Syrian variant, it says in the report, it says this has to do with a verse in Surah Al-An'am, this is chapter 6. Uh, and it says, uh, in the Syrian mushafs, it's written shuraka'ihim with a ya, and in all of the other mushafs, it's written as shuraka'uhum with a wow. But when we look at mushafs, what we find is, so here I have the CPP, there was a ya here, but it was erased, and this is the Birmingham 1572b, there was also a ya here, but it was erased, but these two have ya's, and they're Syrian mushafs. But if we look at all of the other early mushafs, or even not even terribly early, we find, we don't find shuraka'uhum with a wow, we find it caseless, there's no case foul. It's just shurakahum. And as well as late as this is the Husseini Mus'haf, it's just shurakahum. And again, in so many Mus'hafs, this is Sarai Medina 1, and this is the Katalangar Mus'haf, and we find this in many uh, uh, manuscripts, that it completely lacks this vowel. And only in later ma manuscripts, like Samarqand here, and this is a B2 Zidan manuscript, uh, this is Arab 339, we find the wow show up. And so that discrepancy, nobody talks about this caseless form, but they all talk about the form with the wow. And so this discrepancy can allow us to date the reports and informs us that these people were just looking at contemporary mushafs. They were not going and seeking out the oldest mushafs they could find, they were just looking at the mushafs of their time, which is mid second century, late second century, which had these forms in them, which had the wow, as opposed to the earliest mushafs. And there are a few exceptions to this, but this is the general thing. We have another example, uh, this is not a regional variant, but all Muslim scholars report that فَخَرَاجُ Rabbik in Q23 is spelled uh, plain A with an alif. في جميع المصاحف بالألف. All Mus'hafs have this with an alif. But again, you look inside manuscripts. I only have show three here, but there are so many. I have Vechtain right here, and all of these, they don't have an alif in them. And you go back to Sakhawi, and he's talking about, the, remember that really ancient Syrian Mus'haf? And he says that uh, I saw in that ancient Syrian Mus'haf, uh, the one I mentioned before, 
فَخَرْجُ بِغَيْرِ ألف. I've seen it written, فَخَرْج without an alif. So defective spelling. And so he goes on and he chastises, he criticizes the previous scholars who write the Rasm works. And he says, وَلَا يَنْبَغِي It is inappropriate, it is unacceptable, لِمَنْ لَمْ يَطَّلَعَ عَلَى جَمِيعُهَا That wh the, whoever has not looked at every single mushaf to say da'wa ذَلَكَ To make the claim that they have looked at all mushafs. And so as a counterexample, what I show here is Sarai Medina uh, uh, M1A, which is a relatively early mushaf, and it's actually spelled plainly. It's erased, the alif is erased, but it's spelled fakharaj with an alif right there. Okay, so now I want to move on to taking all this data in and doing phylogenetic analysis. Now, if you're not familiar with what phylogenetics is, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview. The idea behind phylogenetics is to study the evolutionary history of organisms. We have surviving organisms, we can collect their DNA, look at the fossil record, look at morphology, and then we can use methods through relationships between DNA and the morphology to try to reconstruct shared ancestry between species and organisms. And there's actually a lot of similarities between uh, evolutionary biology and between manuscripts, and in particular handwritten manuscripts. So I've given a couple, and there are some differences, but we adjust for that. But we can think of some similarities uh, between hand-copied manuscripts, like Scrabble errors. So when DNA is copied, it's imperfect, mutations happen. The same way when you copy a manuscript by hand, you can make some random mistakes. And you can also have contamination, so you can have the influence of another mushaf, you can copy from multiple exemplars, and actually we call this something called horizontal gene transfer. So you can have horizontal tr gene tra transfer happen between organisms uh, or across uh, species. Now the key thing is that as these changes accumulate, you can track these inherited changes and try to reconstruct what we would be, we'll call a stemma in manuscripts, but an evolutionary tree. And so we can take essentially manuscripts and represent them in the same way that DNA point mutations are represented, and we can run our analysis. And so after running the analysis, oops, uh, what we see is the following. So I want to turn your attention to this right here. So this is a tree. This is what's called a consensus tree. And this is a tree of what we get. I want to point out a few things. Here we have a cluster of mushafs that were assigned uh, Medinan uh, regionality, and they sit in the center. And this is important because the closer to the midpoint you are, the more uh, uh, archaic you are, the closer to the, the base of the tree you are. Okay? It doesn't mean that these mushafs are older. It means that they are part of a tradition that is older. I just want to make that distinction. And you find a cluster of Iraqi mushafs here and a cluster of Syrian mushafs here with a few branching. So the, the uh, uh, Grosner codex, uh, codex, the Husseini mushaf, uh, branches off and Vegtain branches off and the Rampur Raza as well. So that tells us there's a little bit of contamination going on. And so what we need to do is we need to visualize this contamination with a better approach. And so looking at contamination and assigning a root to that tree, we get something that looks like this. So I, I'll talk you through this. Uh, the colors here represent the ideal assignment of regionality. So Basran is this red, Kufan is a blue, Medinan is this orange, and Syrian is this green. And the solid, okay, so these circles uh, that are empty, that are not colored, represent hypothetical shared ancestors. So this is the shared ancestor of these manuscripts that we're predicting must have existed. And I have just assigned them letters according to what we would expect. Okay, so th then solid lines represent a very strong relationship and dashed lines represent contamination. Okay, so here, looking here, we have Medina M. We have a very strong relationship to all the mushafs that were attributed to Medina with the exception of this one, but there's a lot of contamination. The same we can say for the Syrian mushafs. And then for the Basran mushafs right here, and the Kufan, we have the Husseini manuscript with contamination from Basran, and the Samarqand, which is a little more Basran potentially, with some contamination from Kufa. Now notice that when I initially presented the picture from Cook, we had only four exemplars. But if you look here, we have one, two, three, four, five. And I labeled one B and one B prime. So what's going on here? Remember that Basran variant I talked to you about that we ignored? So if we actually take that into account, and I actually include, I just include all the raw data, you can see that there must be a divergence that happens, and this divergence represents the fact that these mushafs have something that was innovated later on, so that it hints at some modification that might have taken place to an original exemplar, a regional exemplar. Okay, the other interesting thing 
is that this algorithm suggests that the Medinan Codex is the most likely Uthmanic archetype. So it seems that this Medinan Mus'haf was the first Mus'haf that was written or copied, and from it, all of the other codices were copied, and they all descend from the Medinan Codex. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this Basran variant. So the Basran variant is in uh, Q23, Surah Al-Mu'minun, and it's verses 85 to 89. And so there's a series of question and, uh, questions and answers that go on. So, قُلْ لِمَنِ الْأَرْضِ To whom does the earth belong or the land belong to? The answer is, سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ It belongs to God. And then you have two uh, other interrogatives here. قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ Who is the Lord of the heavens and the earth? And the most Mus'hafs, they say, say lillah, they will say, to God, it belongs, which is a bit strange. Uh, and the third one as well, قُلْ مَنْ بِيَدِهِ In whose hands are the keys to the kingdom, etc. Say lillah. Now the Basran variant, these second two are actually written as say Allah, they will say God. And that actually makes a little more in, uh, intuitive sense. And so the more difficult reading here is more probably original. So we have Lissitude uh, Difficilior uh, uh, applying here. Uh, and what's interesting is we actually have reports that the, the Boston variant was added later. And so we have a report, uh, a number of reports, going back to Asim al-Jahdari, who was a Boston reader uh, and scribe. And he says that uh, he was responsible, uh, uh, or he ascribes the addition of these two to Nasr ibn Asim. Uh, and others, Hassan al-Basri ascribes this to uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who was actually a governor of Basra um, and of Khurasan. Uh, now, the, the key thing is there's a lot more involved in here, but the, the point is that if you go through all the analysis, there's no evidence that al-Hajjaj was involved in this variant at all. Uh, and actually, uh, we find that later B2 manuscripts contain uh, Allah, Sayyiduna Allah. So what about earlier ones? Well, the only earlier Basra manuscript that we identify is Arab 331, and unfortunately, the folios that contain that variant are missing. So, you know, alas, what can you do? Uh, so there's no way to sort of verify this, but, you know, my suspicion is that, and based on the stemma, the analysis, is that this variant was a later edition. Okay, so another interesting thing that comes up is, if you look at the majority of, of reports that uh, have to do with the Syrian variants, they talk about the Mus'haf Uthman sent to Sham, to Syria. Except for one report which comes to us from uh, Abu, uh, Abu Hatim al-Sijistani, he's a third century Muslim scholar, and he talks about, وَفِي مُصْحَفِ حِمْسِ الَّذِي بَعَثَ بِهِ عُثْمَانُ إِلَى الشَّامِ And in the Himsi Mus'haf, the Mus'haf of Hims, the one that Uthman sent to the Syria. So he seems to indicate that this Mus'haf went to Hims when intuitively you'd think maybe Damascus. And uh, he actually adds, in addition to the known variants, an additional one. He says in Anfal, ma kana linnabi. So there's a definite al in there. You know, ma kana linnabi versus what the typical uh, reading is, ma kana linnabi. And what's interesting is the Damascene, Ibn Amr, the canonical reader, does not read lilnabi, he reads linnabi. And if we look at the earliest mushafs that we have that actually are Syrian, so the CPP, the British Library Mus'haf, Arab 6140a, and, uh, which has some counterpart folios in Cambridge, uh, which actually I've studied this, uh, this Mus'haf, all of these three have Hemsi verse counts, first of all. So they have Hemsi character. And actually, if you look for this variant, you find them. So actually, this is the uh, uh, Cambridge folios, ma kana linnabi. This is the British Library Mus'haf, ma kana linnabi. And in the edition produced by Professor de Roche, it's there as well, but I don't have a picture uh, of that variant. Uh, but all three of the oldest manuscripts that are Syrian that have this variant available, they have Linnabi, which is uh, uh, in accordance to this report, they have a Hemsi verse count. Uh, and so it really does seem that the codex, what I'm proposing is that the codex that Uthman sent uh, to Syria was actually sent uh, to Hems as opposed to Damascus, which we might uh, think intuitively. Uh, and so with that, I would like to conclude uh, with the fact that by looking at the manuscript data, starting with the idea that you know, Michael Cook put down, when looking at the manuscript data and analyzing it using phylogenetics, we can confirm that there is actual presence of regionality uh, and there are four exemplars uh, that comes out of the data. There are four exemplars uh, out of the data that we get from the manuscripts. The Medinan exemplar appears to be the original Uthmanic archetype from which all other Uthmanic Mus'hafs descend. And we can look at discrepancies between reports uh, in the literature, in the Russian literature, and actual early Mus'hafs, and I have a few more, I just had time to go through two of them, that actually allow us to date these traditions to the mid-2nd century. And they don't seem to go back much earlier than that. 
So this is a very early date, uh, we can say. And there is contamination. We find some Mus'hafs have contamination. And what that hints is at interaction between uh, orality and uh, textuality. So for example, the Tubkapi Mus'haf, it's very Medinan, but it has a Syrian variant, which is Hu alladhi yanshurukum versus yusayirukum in Q10. And the canonical reader Abu Ja'far, he reads very Medinan, except in this one variant where he reads yanshurukum as well. So there's a bit of similarity in there, and that hints at some sort of interaction going on. We also actually found, so Sarai Medina 1, I don't have time to go through it, but actually it turns out it's a composite codex. As the hand switches from a different script to the Umayyad script, it actually switches from being uh, uh, non-Syrian to being Syrian, fully Syrian, which is uh, very cleanly. Uh, and so it seems that these people who put together this Mus'haf had multiple codices of different regions available to them at the same time. Uh, and of course, the, uh, what I just showed you, that the Syrian Codex was very likely sent to Hems as opposed to Damascus. Uh, and with all of this said, I think it'd be very useful to, to take a closer look at uh, what I call microstomatics. So, you know, there are many tiny variants in, you know, plain A, defective spelling in elifs, little things like that. All, in collecting all of that and doing a much higher resolution study will shed more light on the detailed relationship between all of these manuscripts, especially ones that come from, you know, have the similar provenance and might come from the same deposit. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening.